Good afternoon and welcome to all of you who've joined us today for this third Thursday conversation. I'm Janine Birchie Johnson and I serve as alumni director as well as director of campus ministries and development and admissions associate. I'm very excited to be back in my office for the first time today in over a year and very excited that all of you have joined us. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we get started. Please note that the webinar is being recorded, including our question time. If you have any technical concerns at any point, just send a chat message to the AMBS host. And if you have a comment or question for our speaker, we ask you to use the Q&A feature, and then I will uh, go through those and ask uh, certain questions from that group of questions. Um, so that all of you can see who else has joined the webinar, uh, please use the chat function to give us your name, location, and what years you uh, were at AMBS. And make sure you uh, send that to all panelists and attendees, not just panelists, because otherwise everyone else won't see it. So we invite you to uh, let each other know who's here. Turning now to the reason we're all here. Dr. Beverly Lapp is in her third year as Vice President and Academic Dean at AMBS. She brings more than two decades of experience in academic affairs, teacher development, curricular design, and intercultural exchange to her work. Bev previously served on the music faculty at Goshen College for 23 years, where she chaired the music department, directed the core curriculum, and led four study service term semesters in China, Peru, and the Dominican Republic. Bev is an active church musician and has a deep interest in the relationship between music and theology. Bev will start by answering several questions that I have for her, and then after that, we'll have time for your questions and comments as well. Bev, thank you for joining us today. And I'd like you to begin by just telling us anything you would like us to know about yourself as an introduction. Thank you. It's so good to be with all of you today. Um, I, I would like to share a few photos with you to um, tell you a little bit more about myself, um, but we'll only do this for, for part of our time. So I will share my screen. Um, because I'd, I'd like to tell you where I grew up. I'm a child of um, Franconia. I grew up in um, Lansdale, Pennsylvania, and um, within Franconia Mennonite Conference, which is now uh, part of Mosaic Conference. Um, these were, uh, these, this is a part of Pennsylvania that um, has rolling hills and, and curvy roads. And uh, when I was in grade school, my family moved to the home on Allentown Road, which is um, the photo you see, that John and Edith Lapp built and raised nine children in, including my father, Sam. My grandfather owned Lapp's Grocery on Main Street in Lansdale, but had to eventually sell after he was chosen by lot to be minister at Plains Mennonite Church and later bishop in the Franconia Mennonite Conference. Uh, my lap cousins and I like to um, muse about uh, what might have happened if he had not been chosen by lot. Would we be grocery magnates now, for example, um, if that moment had not turned out that way? When uh, the lap family growing up, um, well, first I'll show a photo of my uh, um, grandparents and their children. Uh, my father, Sam, is um, on the left there. And uh, my memory growing up um, was that when the laps were together, most um, of the cousins slipped away when the conversation inevitably shifted to church politics. Um, and I usually stayed to listen because I found that very interesting. My roots extend further west um, near, to near Harrisburg where Ferris and Emma Longenecker ran a farm and butcher shop with the help of their seven children, including my mother, Helen. My grandma Longenecker's kitchen was a place of warmth and comfort and the farm property was a place of endless cousin adventures, um, exploring barn lofts, fishing ponds and the life cycle of animals. 
My mother is standing on the right in this photo. Both sets of grandparents were devout Mennonite Christians. It, it seemed to me growing up that the Laps were stoic, service-oriented, and pretty scholarly about their faith, while the Longeneckers were more evangelical and expressive in tone and eager to talk about their personal relationship with Jesus. I've been profoundly blessed and shaped by both families. Um, interestingly, uh, as you can see from the photos, um, the conservative Mennonite dress my parents grew up in, the Longeneckers actually considered the laps uh, a little liberal and uh, were only um, assured uh, when my mom started dating a lap that, that, her, that uh, my dad's father was a bishop that, that made a key difference in their estimation. Um, I'm not gonna go into this detail about my story um, moving forward, but um, there were uh, significant years for my family serving with MCC in Jamaica. Here we are on Allentown Road, um, back view of the house, getting ready to leave for our MCC term, Mennonite Central Committee term there, I'm on the left. And here we are in Jamaica, in Kingston, where we lived and my parents were country uh, representatives for the Jamaica MCC unit. Those were formative years in so many ways, um, including that I experienced and uh, lived and was formed by um, a service a view of, of Mennonite Anabaptist um, service and um, a framework that uh, has, has stayed with me um, in terms of serving and living alongside our siblings around the world when we have the opportunity. And it was, it was just a dynamic um, time to, to see my parents engage in, in uh, their work with the MCC team. Another significant part of this story is that this is where I became um, uh, a pianist. I had been taking some lessons, but I had a much more uh, intense experience with a um, incredible teacher while we were living in Kingston. Jumping forward uh, because of, of that, the music program at Goshen College was a real draw when the time came for that. And the next few years um, have been a, um, a time of Goshen College as my base with graduate school here and there. And here's the end of um, my formal education um, in New York City after getting my doctorate at Columbia. Um, and these are my two daughters. So I just wanted to share that, that part of my journey and I think I will get to other parts um, with other questions. So I'll stop with the photos for now. Thanks, Bev. Um, can you tell us a story about a time when you experienced God in a powerful way? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, when I uh, when we came home from Jamaica, uh, we moved back to Lansdale, and I went to eventually after um, middle school went to Christopher Dock Mennonite High School, now Dock Mennonite Academy. And um, in those years, uh, we had a major cultural adjustment coming back to southeastern Pennsylvania. And um, I, I can remember a particular moment where I experienced my emerging um, kind of best gift at the piano as a direct um, gift from God. I was um, a struggling adolescent in many ways. And I, I remember uh, times where being able to do what I could do at that stage in life was uh, gave me such connection with other people and affirmation and a feeling of purpose. And I, I just felt this intense gratitude and um, remember it, it feeling like it was, um, it was completely outside myself, the, the intensity of feeling that directness. So that, that's one, one story along those lines, I could tell others. And Bev, what attracted you to come to the AMBS community? Yes, thank you. Um, so 
I think I'll start backwards with a story from um, one of my first weeks at AMBS and, uh, and then circle back to the, the discernment that led me here. Um, there's a structure in our uh, community life, academic life for the, for the faculty um, called the Teaching Research Seminar. And uh, six times a year, the AMBS teaching faculty and um, sometimes administrative faculty gather um, for a seminar. And it, the basic idea is that is to have a chance to share and respond to each other's um, scholarship. And uh, at my very first seminar that year, an argument emerged. It, it, we were in um, with, with Marsum around a, a very large conference table and as things got heated, I remember feeling very alarmed and anxious because this didn't happen much in my time at Goshen College. Uh, I, and I could spend a lot of time analyzing that. But what I soon learned in this moment was that it was all okay. I, I soon uh, within minutes came to recognize this as a very healthy argument. And just to tell you a little bit about it, because um, I think this audience will, will be interested. Uh, there was on, on one hand, a passionate reminder of our sacred responsibility to teach historical context and critical scholarship in biblical studies and theological education. The, the person presenting their work um, was making this argument. And there was on the other hand, a, a fervent rejoinder that scripture is for anyone to have a powerful encounter with whether or not one has this contextual knowledge. And the, the, the two key uh, characters in this debate really uh, vigorously uh, went at it for a while with others chiming in here and there. And so there was this back and forth, but um, there was also laughter, there were calming voices and this ultimate recognition that even as these two ideas were in tension, we, we could see truth on both sides and bring them together. And I just remember sitting there among this group of exceptional uh, professors and delighting in the intellectual confidence, um, the theological generosity, and collegial trust that was in that space um, and that helped me realize why this argument felt, felt safe. And it was uh, just one of those moments where I thought, I can't believe I'm here and I'm so glad I'm here. Um, but to say a little bit more about uh, what attracted me, I, as Janine said in the introduction, I was at Goshen College for 23 years and I was feeling ready for, for something new I wondered, uh, is it time to um, be somewhere less Mennonite? That was an active question in my head, um, which of course is, is funny now to think about where I ended up. I, I remember having uh, attraction to an organization or institution that um, where, the, where finances were, were not a worry. Um, and not that, uh, AMBS um, is not on, is, I, well, I can assure you that AMBS is on solid financial footing, but of course we are a, a place that uh, depends on the graciousness of our donors and, and of, of God. Um, and so I, I just uh, am struck that the things I thought I might be drawn to um, were so very different. So um, I, the, I had um, made it, known um, in my network that I was really feeling an affinity for academic administration and um, gaining experience with that. And uh, when I was approached um, about the AMBS position, I, I did initially think that just doesn't make sense to me. Um, but in discernment with some people who knew the institution uh, were steeped in theological education, uh, became convinced that it was, it was worth looking into. And um, as I learned more, uh, that was just um, affirmed. And I may talk later about how and why as a musician, I, I felt uh, I had any business being a dean in a theological school. But I'll stop there for now. Well, I love that God has a sense of humor and I'm so glad that you are here, Bev. Um, 
you have so much on your plate, um, so many different things going on, but I'm wondering if you could identify some of the key projects you're working on this year and just describe some of those for our alumni. Sure. Um, I uh, am in a role where work on the curriculum is constant and I get to do this with um, a, a committee that has existed at AMBS for a very long time, the curriculum committee. Um, but the, the teaching faculty are um, involved, of course, in, in our discernment. And um, one of the things I really value about being here is that we, um, we have engaged administrative faculty who really care about the graduate curriculum as well. Um, so that is a key area and just constant project I'm working on. Um, academic policy um, is, is also significant. And I think this year it has been a key project because our accreditor, Association of Theological Schools, uh, did a major revision of their um, accreditation standards last summer. And uh, this was, I think, a very good um, revision. We had just been through our 10-year reaccreditation my first year at AMBS. Um, but they, they moved in a direction of uh, one could say more freedom and higher rigor um, at the same time, but it, it opened up some uh, need for us to revisit some of our policies that were very much in place because of ATS requirements. So we that's been a major area of looking at um, our policies. Um, this particular year, the pandemic has been um, uh, you know, a constant reality, and I've been involved in um, in our um, guidelines and decisions around that. And I, I think in in my role and the faculty role and roles um, of people like Janine, we're just seeing the realities and impact of the pandemic, and now some renewed hope um, that we are hopefully moving um, into a better stage, uh, just how that impacts our students, our employee group, um, how, we, how we do what we do at every level. So those are a few things. Um, we were um, in a, a time where uh, exploration of, of new partnerships and programs is, um, is energized and uh, the new strategic plan that Dave Bushart as our new president um, has led is now in place and guiding a lot of our work. But those are a few highlights. That just boils it down to so few things, Bev, when I know you've got many, many more things going, but thank you for identifying those key things that you're working on this year. I'm wondering if you can say a bit about your dreams for AMBS as you look forward. Uh, you mentioned the strategic plan, but what are your own um, hopes and dreams? Yeah, um, I think I'll go back to, well, uh, this um, preparation for, for this uh, third Thursday time um, took me back to uh, one of my interviews at AMBS. So it was a multi-stage process. And um, at one point I was asked to do some significant writing um, on some very important questions that the search committee um, sent me. And one of them was around theological vision. And so I was interested in, in going back and looking at that, um, that statement that I um, developed at the time. And I'll, I'll read it, it's just a paragraph. My vision for theological education. And I was interested in, boy, how well does this align with our new strategic plan with um, what I've learned and experienced at AMBS in my first three years. So this is what I wrote at the time. This would have been in 2018, spring of 2018. Uh, no, sorry, spring of 2017. Theological education is an integrative pursuit that calls forth excellent biblical, sociological, and theological scholarship and dynamic practitioner training to prepare pastors, teachers, and leaders. In an anxious, fearful, and polarized society, theological education is a healing, unifying, and transformative endeavor that reaches deep and wide to strengthen denominational institutions, 
to empower interdenominational partnerships and to enable interfaith dialogue. And I, I further reflected that there were three things in my um, own formation that shaped this vision. So first, my journey with the church uh, motivated my belief in the vital role of theological education. My first pastors were th seminary graduates, and I observed the um, impact of that on their, um, their work during my childhood and young adult years at Plains Mennonite Church in Lansdale. When I went to graduate school for the first time, um, I was fresh out of college from Goshen College um, at Westminster Choir College um, in Princeton, New Jersey. And I attended a large, the large and well-staffed Nassau Presbyterian Church in Princeton. And I saw preaching in a whole new way as an art form during those years in Princeton at that, at that church. Um, I observed in later years, my home church going through some very painful years of conflict centered around pastoral leadership. Um, this was followed uh, by being able to observe healing and um, that led to some long um, term pastorates that continue today. Most formatively in my adult life, um, Assembly Mennonite in Goshen has been my home uh, congregation and I've observed there a much more um, uh, uh, congregational uh, style of leadership, um, a, a, uh, a particular style very rooted in, in Anabaptist theology. Um, so there's high levels of participation and excellent um, lay teaching and preaching and less centering on the on pastoral leadership. Um, it has uh, centered and uh, focused on pastoral leadership in recent years more than early years there, however. So that, that's one influence, my story with the church. Um, another one that um, helped me think about my vision is my experience with young adults in Mennonite higher education. And just very briefly, um, I would um, say that at Goshen College, um, I observed the trends that we see elsewhere in society of um, less identification with, with church membership. Um, and I think there was, uh, there were periods of time while I was there where faculty and others felt a lot of uncertainty as the ground was shifting uh, beneath us um, in terms of undergraduate uh, rates of attendance at church and, and their, their faith identity and commitments. In my very last year at Goshen, I, I started to see another shift. I went to China with, um, for a semester with my family and a group of, of students. And we were in this um, uh, amazing uh, city and country uh, with much less evident Christianity around us. Um, and, there, and so it, uh, it created this, um, I think, openness and hunger among this group of college students to talk more openly about our faith commitments. When I returned to Goshen College for what ended up being my last semester, I found myself in a really different space. And I, um, in various classes and I think appropriate ways would, would uh, make more explicit faith connections than I had previously. And what I observed was light in, in the eyes of my students, almost um, even relief. Uh, there's, there's a hunger out there. And I, I was recognizing that at the time where I started to think about um, a potential move to AMBS. And then the final um, influence is, uh, and I won't go into detail here, but I, I realized in my processing that I was um, impacted by the integrative work of theological and biblical scholarship as a child. My pastor at Plains Mennonite, uh, who taught a very rigorous series of baptism classes was Gerald Studer. And uh, he was a graduate of Mennonite Biblical Seminary and um, the Studer Bible collection uh, is here in the AMBS library. That's over 5,000 um, rare editions that he um, methodically and, and uh, over significant amount of time um, collected. And in, in those baptism classes, I'll just say, I, I became aware of um, 
an intellectual push that he was giving us to analyze the text with great care and precision. Um, I think there were a lot of complex ideas that floated above my 13 year old brain at the time, but it, there was something very exciting about it. And I think that um, that awareness um, has lingered with me and um, made me, uh, I, I think made me actually a better musician and um, academic um, in other areas. So uh, now to the vision again, which by now we've all forgotten um, and it's alignment with the strategic plan. Um, I do see resonance there. Um, and I think one of the things that's not there that I don't think I fully understood was how much um, our global um, Anabaptist education vision would be expanded and is expanding. Um, but I, I just I do want to mention that I have only seen further evidence that AMBS um, is a place that I think can model a way out of some of the polarization that we see around us. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about continuing to think about that. Thank you. And I'm wondering if you have a question you would like to ask the alumni um, and then alumni, you can either answer in the chat or if you wanna do a longer, um, if you wanna connect it to a question, you can put it in the Q&A. But Bev, what would you like to know from the folks who've joined us today? Thank you. You know, related to one of the things I said about uh, influences on my my vision for theological education in this context was about observing young adult trends with Christian faith. And so my question would be, uh, I'm, I'm interested in what our alumni are observing about young adults in the church and how they claim church uh, when they do, um, how they do and and how they don't. Um, so when are they claiming um, their place in the church and when are they not? And then um, I guess a similar question would be around faith. Um, is there a uh, um, difference when it comes to personal faith? Um, is there more uh, interest there than there is in, in church membership or church life? Um, and I mean, broadly on that topic, what gives you hope about um, the church in spite of trends? Um, or what do you think we at the seminary need to be paying attention to? Thanks, that's such a great question. So I invite you, if you have a response to, to answer in the chat, and if several of those come in, then I'll, I'll share those later. Um, we're gonna move now to questions that you have for Bev. And so if you have something you wanna ask, please put that in the, the Q&A feature. And I'll start with a question from Arden Shank. And this is about the, the faculty as a whole, Bev. So um, Mennonite scholarly research in past years often focused on church history, pacifism, personal faith and behavior, biblical texts, and the relationship to government and the world in general. In recent years, there is emerging interest in research, writing, and teaching about systemic injustice, the wealth gap between the rich and the poor, and advocacy to make change. Could you give some examples of this kind of work that AMBS faculty are doing in this area from a biblical and theological perspective? Thank you, Arden, for that question. Yes, thank you. Uh, that, that's a really helpful framework, and I um, find resonance in that with our faculty. Uh, and um, some, some key examples, um, this year in, um, in the reality of the, the pandemic and the systemic injustices that uh, were illuminated even more clearly for us um, during this time, Jenna Hunter Bowman, who is director of our of Peace Studies here at AMBS, um, teaches a weekly witness colloquium class and uh, this has always been open to um, community members who are interested in attending along with, with students. Um, this year, because it was on Zoom, uh, the um, network was expanded. And um, 
I mean, Jana's work, um, I think is a solid representation of uh, relating um, Mennonite scholarly uh, research to um, systemic injustice and um, change um, advocacy and change making. So um, in summary, I would uh, just note that Jana's framework that she brings to this is, is a peace building uh, framework, very rooted in peace theology and Anabaptist theology, um, but with a, a, um, a real focus on, on advocacy and action. So that's one example. Um, I, I think um, in our, our Bible department and um, history, theology and ethics department, we, we see other examples as well. Um, I would just note that our faculty are um, increasingly interested in public scholarship um, and in scholarship that serves the church uh, and the academy. That's always been an expectation of AMBS um, teaching faculty but um, leaning into the, um, the public uh, um, more and more. So um, venues where um, the relevance of theological studies and biblical scholarship to providing direction and um, avenues to address the systemic injustice. I, I just see constant focus on that in our faculty's work. And then, Finally, in their teaching, um, this is something I think our, our students really recognize as a, as a focus. I, I think it's such a good question. And I, I just wanna to note too that um, there is a bit of a tension because in any discipline, there is a love of the discipline for the discipline itself. Um, and, and so I personally um, and philosophically want to make space for that because I think that's where so much uh, beauty and um, uh, connection with, with God happens in our disciplinary study. Uh, but I think part of, of theological education um, helping revive the church is leaning in on, on the relevance to today's pressing questions. Thank you. Uh, Ken Quiring has asked, um, thanks you for sharing some of your story. And when you referred to experiencing preaching as an art form, he would appreciate it if you would describe a couple of specific examples of this, as well as maybe some more general reflection on how you have found preaching to be an art form. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ken. Yes, uh, I, you know, at the, the story I told, um, from Nassau Presbyterian Church in Princeton, I would have been around 22 years old. Um, and I had certainly observed good preaching by then. Um, but I would, I would say I saw more uh, um, less scripted models of preaching, um, although that's a little too simplistic too, because I think um, some of the, the older Mennonite preachers that I would have um, been in congregation with uh, were incredible um, unscripted speakers, but it was it was a um, more um, tightly constructed uh, sermon that I started to recognize, and um, there was more of a sense of arc and um, and process in that construction. So, in terms of a couple specific examples. Um, here at AMBS, um, more recently, um, I have, um, in general, observed a, what I would call a fairly intensely ex expressive worship style, and um, that just really struck me, and I think, you know, uh, we're, um, we have graduate students here who are passionate about preparing for ministry, and bringing them full selves into worship, but that, that is, I see that broadly, but then extended to um, some preaching 
uh, styles, which um, are very dramatic and um, focused on uh, um, that, that dramatic art, uh, arc that um, is in the construction. I, but I also see um, um, more scripted um, and very well-crafted preaching as another um, really important uh, model that I've, I value. And um, so I wanna be, uh, um, I mean, clear about my interest in both of those, those forms um, to put a little too um, bifurcated a, a spin on, on the two styles. Uh, the only other thing I, I would say at the moment is, um, um, uh, you know, I've, I've come to understand, and, and Alan Rudy Froze has helped me with this, um, that uh, preaching, um, there, there is technique and uh, there, is, um, there are strategies, and, um, but there is also uh, so much individual, um, individuality that, that we bring to this. And then um, here at AMBS, the, the leaning in on biblical um, exegesis and um, relevance in preaching has been so exciting to see. Thank you. Um, Hank Landis uh, is curious to hear a little bit more about the shift that happened for you as a teacher when you came back from China. Uh, could you say a little bit more about that? Uh, maybe what you felt changed before you were there and after you came back? Thank you, Hank. Yes, um, thank you for that question. Um, before I went to China, I, I won't go into detail, but I had good, it, I knew that it could potentially be my last year at Goshen College. Um, and I, I, I was very, um, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a great, great quote about in Harold Bender's, um, the, the Goshen Dean's uh, biography about um, conversations with, um, the Mennonite Biblical Seminary and Goshen Biblical Seminary uh, merging, but not merging so much as sharing a campus. And Harold Bender greatly wanted that to stay at Goshen um, and resisted the idea of another location. Um, and in that uh, story in the book, um, there's a, a, a analysis that Bender just couldn't bear the thought of leaving Goshen. And I, I was finding myself in that space sometimes. So even as I felt called to some sort of change, I, uh, Goshen um, is, uh, ha has had and, and has a strong hold on me. The imprint of Goshen on, my, um, on me is, is powerful and good and I'm so grateful to the institution. Um, but you know, I was very young when I started there. I was 25 um, when I joined the music faculty. I didn't have a doctorate yet. That happened um, in the middle of, of my time there. And so 23 years later, um, just felt like a key moment. Am I, am I staying um, for the rest of my, my career or um, is it time for a shift? So China, um, the opportunity came there. We had led SST study service term, the Goshen International Ed Program previously, and um, I was passing on uh, the department chair role to a, a colleague and had um, the opportunity to do this. And it felt like a good transition experience. But, I, but, but interestingly, it was um, also a it's, a, it's, it's a quintessential Goshen uh, experience um, for a faculty member and for students. And it, it helped me, I think, be grateful for and uh, reflect on what this institution, um, how it had formed me and, and was forming our students, even with how dramatically higher ed has changed everywhere, including at Goshen College. Um, so I felt more ready to, um, uh, I think, be open to uh, what was going to transpire when I came back. And so I, I was, there was the possibility that I would stay at Goshen, but it wasn't, um, I was opening myself up to, and I think 
being able to have an intense, another intense study abroad experience gave me space to be ready for that. <clears throat> and it sounds like from what you said earlier that there was also a sense in which there was more freedom for you to speak about faith issues as you were teaching. Um, is that what I heard you say? Do you wanna push that out a little bit more? What, what that looked like for you? Yeah, thank you for that um, reminder. I. Um, and and I'll, I'll put another um, element on this topic in that, on the, on the faith topic in that China, well, any um, intense intercultural experience, it, it, you know, brings you to your knees in multiple ways. Um, and that I think is a, a spiritual um, opportunity and, um, so I think for, for all of us who were in that group together, that was at play at different, in different ways. Um, previously, in previous years at Goshen, um, as anyone who um, follows our, our Mennonite schools knows, the, the demographic shift has been significant. And so as the Mennonite numbers were decreasing and other, um, demographic groups increasing, uh, there was a lot of conversation at Goshen about how are we hospitable to non-Mennonites? And I would say there was a, um, a tendency to, in an attempt to not be alienating, uh, to um, speak less openly about our uh, Mennonite Anabaptist faith. And so I, um, I was in, in, in the midst of this and yet also uh, reading and um, seeing the, the research about um, young people leaving the church and thinking we, we've got to do something differently here. So uh, Goshen's doing so many wonderful things as are um, other um, Mennonite schools um, to nurture faith. And I think as the demographics have settled, it, there's, there's new opportunities there. For me, what was so interesting about coming to AMBS is that there was none of that um, self-consciousness or anxiety. And it's not that um, we don't also need to look carefully at, at how we can be ex exclusionary um, and alienating um, in, in the, um, the ways we may express our our, uh, our tradition and our faith, but um, the identity and the commitment, it's, it's just such a different type of institution. And it was, um, it was a homecoming for me. And honestly, it's helped me um, think about uh, how we as a seminary do relate to our, our sister institutions that are serving younger students than we are. A question that came in uh, earlier before before we started meeting today from uh, David Myers um, was, as academic dean, what's your vision for seminary education at AMBS and, and what are the top challenges in implementing that vision? That's a huge question, but uh, invite you to say what you want to say about that. Sure. Um, well, I think um, Related to this is, I mean, one of the challenges is that uh, I come from a different disciplinary background. And in my um, uh, exploration of this role, I, I was um, intrigued, but also concerned about that. And um, so it was important for me in conversations with the, the search committee and then um, um, other groups as the exploration continued to make it really clear that I believe in disciplinary expertise um, and that as a dean with a non-traditional background for a seminary, um, that would be, be my framework. Um, so I, I hold on one hand this very genuine and deep respect for the scholarship and practice of faculty at the front and center um, of, of my work. Um, but I also um, am and was convinced by uh, the people who, who um, 
helped me discern this decision and invite me into it, that my, um, my experience in, as, a, as a musician and music scholar uh, brought relevance to this role as well, and that there was a lot of transferable um, uh, skill and knowledge there. So um, I just want to note that as a um, reality and uh, the, I remember asking the, the search committee, why would you hire a non, uh, someone without a theological background for this role? And um, it was expressed that of different disciplines that, that could, could have been brought, um, music was one that felt the most um, aligned and, uh, and, um, and transferable with, with theology. So I've, I've had a lot of work to do to um, prepare myself and to keep preparing myself to, to lead in this context. But um, my, uh, my broad vision is to um, draw more people to the, uh, to the possibility of ministry and to the joys and challenges um, of seminary study and um, to equip the faculty to um, be and create a space where that, that joy can be lived out in service to the church. And I, I think my um, a broad uh, experience with, with ed education um, is, and, and uh, with um, with um, assessing of student learning outcomes is is um, helping us with that. So there's both a, a drawing in and a um, equipping while here, and then um, a a deep connection with the church that I want to keep um, inviting our faculty and all of us to do. Um, we have a question from William Block. Um, as a Canadian, how do you see your place in the politically polarized social scene? In particular, how, how does AMBS prepare pastors who might find this affecting congregational life? Wow, great question. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, you know, in, in connecting with, with what I was saying before, I, I mentioned assessing our student learning there's also a um, piece of this that is assessing that our curriculum is relevant for, for the needs of, of our, the churches our, our graduates will be serving in. And I would say to, to your question, there is um, just increasing awareness that this polarization is impacting congregational life and uh, pastoral leadership. And I think um, there's a lot of uh, um, space in our curriculum to prepare for that. Um, but I'm we one of the assessment pieces that we're working on is word from our alumni that that is overwhelming, and the more tools they can have, the better. Um, it, and part of the the reality of some higher ed context is that we can be in a bit of a bubble, and it can be hard um, to be aware of the reality of, of different faith communities that we relate to and that our students are going to be serving. Um, we have theological diversity at AMBS and lots of different experiences impacting how people think about politics and government and the, the, the great debates um, of our time. Um, so I think the bubble is um, not, uh, a huge problem here, but but it's um, it's clear that we need to give uh, more attention to preparing our our graduates to lead um, um, in settings of congregational difference and conflict. So that that's one response to your your very good question that I think needs a lot of attention. Um. Invite others to add their questions to the Q&A feature. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our time here. I'll go ahead with um, a second question from Hank Landis. 
Uh, the February 24th issue of Christian Century has a major article on theological education, interviewing four theological educators in England and North America. And their comments lean towards more seminary education taking place in context of full-time ministry. Mm -hmm. So he's asking, what has AMBS learned about video-based learning in North America and in the global South? And I, I think uh, I think his question is not so much about from the pandemic, but in terms of making education accessible to people at a distance. Yeah. Thank you, Hank. Um, I want to just say one thing about the last question, then get to this one. I just want to note something I wish I had said, which is that in spite of uh, um, the possibility that any higher ed community can be a bubble, at AMBS, um, I do think we have um, significant um, experience building opportunities. Um, I see it among our students all the time, navigating difference and, um, and they, uh, I think, lean on core agreements and a focus on relationships. And, um, and they have a lot of um, opportunity and, and requirements around understanding themselves as um, intercultural learners that I think um, is really significant to preparing for the, um, the, the future roles they'll be playing. To Hank's question about full-time and um, what, what I think was read in that piece of that seemed to say that is the kind of the model that's getting focus. Um, I wanna note that um, I understand a draw to that I would love to have and, and we um, we are we relish and celebrate our full time residential community or maybe uh, other people who who don't live on campus but are studying full time um, in the area. But we have had huge growth in distance um, learners in our degree programs and AMBS um, through previous leaders. Uh, was on um, the early end of um, instructional technology that allows for distance learning formats. And a very um, significant part of this is video conferencing instruction. So the, the format that we're in right now on Zoom, except um, not webinar format, but um, it's a classroom environment um, that, that this year has certainly given us even more experience with. So I just, um, I want to um, promote the idea of both and I, um, I think our future is in um, still having a place for students who have um, the gift of um, being able to do their study full time in a limited number of years, but um, we have more and more bivocational um, students who are uh, part-time and at a distance and uh, com hopefully coming to campus a couple times a year uh, when when things are more um, returned to normal. Uh, so it, it, to just summarize, um, we are, if anything, I think leaning even more into um, more pathways for distance and part-time study. And, and I just want to also just say that um, the Zoom classroom, for for better, uh, for lack of a better term, um, I have seen our faculty do incredible things in that space, and um, I think it can be a really vibrant uh, learning community. And there are some gifts of being able to uh, work in a Zoom classroom. Um, I just started teaching a, a class um, that I've done before in person. But this year, the class includes people in Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Ecuador, as well as Indiana. So that would not have been possible in the past. So this is, this is a, a gift of that option. And we still have to figure out ways to do that. But um, I think everybody's being very creative with those models. Um, Bev, we are out of questions from our alumni, but I want to ask one more question. Um, uh, maybe some alumni have a last minute question here. We have maybe time for one more, depending on how long it takes you uh, to answer this, because this is a great, uh, 
big area again, but I'm curious um, with the arrival of the new hymnal voices together, what mm -hmm. is what's exciting you about that resource and your hopes for that resource? Uh, thank you. Um, I, <laughs> I'm so excited about this new resource and I, um, I think we're all going to have a lot of pent up desire to uh, learn to know it in community um, when we are able to be together in person again and sing together. Uh, I am seeing church music as um, uh, kind of where I want to give my focus in, in the next few years. Um, I get a lot of joy out of song leading and, and congregational song and supporting um, church music um, at the piano. Uh, I think the book is, um, is a, uh, um, just an amazing resource. I'm, I'm just learning to know it, but the, the weekend I got my hands on it, I kind of lost myself to it. I, I, I hardly ate or paid attention to anything else. Um, and it, and I, I remember, um, uh, being aware of, you know, I thought I would just be sort of geeking out on the music, but the theological uh, um, resources in this book are, are incredible. So I'm, I'm very excited about it. And I, um, I think the, the committee's work is a microcosm of, the lot, of a lot of things we're talking about in the church right now. And um, I'm, I know we've had opportunities to learn more about that, but I think there's more learning to do about how they um, uh, wrestled with um, so many competing um, hopes and um, dreams for this book and um, had a process that allowed them to work at that uh, very productively. So if anyone here was involved, congratulations to you. I'm so grateful and so excited about it. Well, thank you, Bev, so much for answering all of these questions. And I just want to note um, that we have had a comment from Maureen Mousy in the in the chat, just assuring you that the youth in her uh, church, Warsaw United Methodist Church, are growing and active and and being creative and leading the way uh, for the whole congregation. So. We, we do have testimony that um, youth are involving themselves in the church. So thank you for that. Um, thanks to all of you for joining us today uh, and for your continued support of AMBS. I've said this before, but I'll say it again. Um, you, our alumni, are such important people in terms of tapping uh, new students on the shoulder, uh, giving financially and your prayer support and and encouraging other people to give that kind of support as well. And we so appreciate that. Coming up, um, we have some alumni reunions planned that will be virtual, um, but instead of just seeing one person speaking, you'll see each other. Those are happening April, May, and June, and they'll be uh, by decade. So you can come to as many of those as you wish, or you know, to whatever years you were at AMBS, choose the ones that you wanna come to. Several retired faculty and long-term current faculty are gonna be joining some of those Zoom reunions um, so that you'll have a chance to check in with uh, people that you knew from your time here uh, who were teaching as well as your own colleagues. So you'll get a postcard about that in the next few weeks and the information has already gone out by email. You can begin to sign up for those times on the uh, website. Another thank you to Becca Baratu, our student who has helped with the tech support for today. And again, thank you to all of you for joining us. I wish you a wonderful rest of the day and God's blessings. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care.